plenty warm, plenty warm. It would be really cold in the Family Activity Center if I didn't come in early and turn the heat on in there. I thought the whole idea of being in there was to spread out. <laughs> Who knows? Shall we open with prayer? Gracious Lord, we give thanks to you for the blessings of this day, for an opportunity to gather and study your word. We pray that you would be with us as we study, that our hearts and minds may be open. By your Holy Spirit, guide us, that our faith may be strengthened and our knowledge increased. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 21 of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. I think we finished with the verse 16 last week. Uh, discussing uh, Paul's uh, <coughs> journey of getting closer to Jerusalem. Um, he has uh, made his way across the Mediterranean. He spent some time on the coast of the mainland, and Jerusalem is the next, uh, the, the next stop. So if we pick up in chapter 21 and verse 17, and the next section goes to about uh, verse 26, uh, where we read, uh, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God and said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses, so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Okay. So... Paul arrives in Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> there is much uh, wagging of the tongues about his work uh, amongst the Gentiles. Uh, with the general consensus, it seems, that uh, the reports that have been given is that he has uh, uh, turned people away from the law of Moses, uh, given them uh, freedom to do as they wish, uh, coming into Christianity, and that has angered those, uh, I would say, not of the Christian faith, uh, but those in Jerusalem that were still clinging to the idea of obedience to the law as a way to uh, please God and uh, gain salvation. Uh, it's kind of a circular uh, Thing that we have here. Remember, Paul uh, had to see the apostles in Jerusalem before he goes on his missionary journeys, and uh, he, he talks about his faith as one who had come uh, from being an unbeliever who zealously uh, was an observer of the law and killed Christians and put them in prison, and now he was a, 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 a missionary for the Lord, an apostle, a representative of God, uh, one sent uh, to preach and to teach uh, these particular things. Uh, and they 
now fear for his life. Uh, fear for his life uh, and are asking him to do some things according to the ceremonial law that they think will quiet uh, those who are speaking against him. You know, I've always thought about this particular section in a framework of, um, you know, our Lutheran understanding of freedom in the gospel, that we have a tremendous freedom in the gospel when things are neither commanded nor forbidden, but sometimes we give up that freedom as a matter of confession uh, because somebody within Christianity has taken the position that it's necessary to do these things or it's necessary to avoid these particular things, you know, in order to be uh, a, pro a proper observation of the faith. And the one that, that comes to mind the most uh, for me is um, baptism uh, and the method of baptizing. In the scriptures, I won't argue the point at all that baptism is the application of water uh, in some form in accordance with Christ's command to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That form could be immersion. It could be sprinkling. It could be pouring. Um, but when when there are those inside of Christianity who take the position that no baptism is a true baptism or a valid baptism unless one is immersed, then it's incumbent upon us as a matter of confession to say we will not immerse. And that's how, you know, that's why infant baptism is mostly done by sprinkling or pouring. Uh, it has nothing to do with the political climate or social climate of today where somebody would say, you know, that's child abuse, they're trying to kill that child by drowning it in the baptismal font or, or those kinds of things. And it has nothing to do with, you know, those who might come to Lutheranism from another Christian tradition and have been immersed. Um, we would say that baptism is completely valid, you know, completely valid. It's a true and, and good scriptural baptism. But when you're told that the baptism of sprinkling or pouring, uh, applying water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is invalid, not true, and no baptism at all, uh, then in, even though you have the freedom to immerse or to sprinkle or to pour, uh, you take the confessional position that you are not immersed. Paul must have Paul must have thought that there was going to be great benefit or opportunity for him to follow um, this uh, ritual, uh, ceremonial practice of purification uh, before entering into the temple, which probably uh, existed uh, of the offering that was given, the vow that was made, some kind of ceremonial washing in a period of time uh, involved in those particular things, rather than taking a position of confession and saying, I will not do this. I will not do this. Um, he takes the position that he does that. Uh, we uh, certainly bow to his wisdom in that particular situation uh, in terms of those, of those things. But we certainly would not have found any fault in him if he had said, uh, no, my righteousness before God is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I will not participate in these particular uh, ceremonial laws that these Jews still observe because Christ has fulfilled that law and it's no longer in force. Uh, you could find no fault with him if he had taken that position. So. I'm, you know, not sure other than, you know, the advice of those who, uh, his fellow Christians who labored in Jerusalem, uh, that he followed that advice with the hopes that, um, like he writes to the Corinthians, I've become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. You know, 
know, he's going to put himself in the position of those Jews in terms of the ceremonial law that he might um, perhaps have the opportunity to communicate salvation to them. But do I think that Paul believes that he gains some kind of worthiness before God to enter into his presence because he goes through these uh, you know, ceremonial rituals? You know, I think he's pretty clear uh, as he communicates to us in many places in his epistles uh, what the Holy Spirit inspires him to communicate, that, that his righteousness before God, his salvation, um, the, the great blessing of faith, his justification, is all a work of God. You know, it's not his work, it's all a work of God. And he's saved by faith, as he writes to the Roman congregation, apart from the deeds of the law. Questions or comments? So what's that letter they're talking about that they wrote to the Gentiles? I think it refers to the last council that Paul had with them about the things that were happening in the Gentile world. Go ahead, take a guess. Remember we talked about that a number of chapters back? how they would write that letter. I think that's probably what they're referring to. You know, that there just were some practices when, that, when you have this transition for people between the, their life of unbelief when they were so uh, ensnared in all of these uh, idolatrous practices to the Christian, now to the Christian faith, that they needed to be instructed that there were some things in terms of these idolatrous practices that were not only things that were not God pleasing, but they were offensive to, to other believers, extremely offensive to other believers. And I think that's what the, what the apostles in Jerusalem are referring to. They wrote that particular letter. Other questions or comments? So do you think stuff like that happens today? Probably so. That certain customs um, are observed in certain congregations. And when you go to those congregations, you observe those particular customs. Hopefully they're not uh, motivated by some kind of legalism. Um, there are things that, uh, that we have in terms of customs here in our congregation that are pretty universal throughout the rest of the synod. And then there would be some things that would be different and other people would have things that would be different and maybe strange to us uh, in those situations. Are, um, are those things wrong? Well, if we're not doing them, they must be wrong, right? <laughs> you know, not necessarily. Two candles on the altar. The congregation I grew up in, there were two in the middle of the altar, there were three on each side of the altar, and there were two candelabras of seven on each side of the sanctuary. So that made 11 candles total. 11 is not really the best biblical number, but that's what we had, all right? So the two large candles were lit only for the communion service. You know, uh, the other candles were lit all the time. Why? Because that's the way it had been done since Noah got off the ark. Right? 
there were three Christmas trees. Now, that's a biblical number. You know? Two, one on each side of the altar. And one, and the church was much like this, where the lectern was here, and, uh, except that the you know, communion rail was back there and transepts were on, on this side, you know, pews for the choirs and where the organ was on, on the side. And then the, the communion rail was closer, like this close probably to the altar where this step is here. Right. And the two Christmas trees up front, uh, this was back in the day when you had the big bulbs, you know, that you could change all the time. They all had purple bulbs on them because it was Lent. And they had put it on purple bulbs on them. The big tree that came in, just because of practicality, uh, was probably put in, you know, the middle of December or you know, first week in December or something like that. It was always about 800 feet tall. And it was put right there so that for all of Lent and Christmas when that tree was up, you know, when the pastor read the lessons, it's like the voice was emanating from the Christmas tree because you couldn't see him. Uh, and uh, that had colored lights on it. But when Christmas Eve came, one of the duties of the altar guild or the ladies group was to change all of the purple bulbs to white bulbs on the Christmas trees by the altar. I'm just telling you this so you can see how easy you have it. All right? Why was it done that way? Because it had been done that way since Noah got off the ark. All right? So, I mean, is it, you know, is it wrong to do it that way? No. You know, uh, if you were told in every other congregation, you must have three Christmas trees. They must have purple bulbs on them, and they must have white bulbs on them. You know, it would be a matter of confession for Christians to say, no, we're not doing that. You know, we're not doing that. So for Paul to observe these particular things, he must have thought, well, perhaps this will uh, give me an opportunity to speak peacefully to these people. In church? Well, my concept of always is about 65 years. <laughs> and I would say in my lifetime, yes. Really? Well, um, you know, there certainly is at least the uh, traditional history from the time of, you know, Luther uh, with the, not that, not that as you read more in history, there's always an argument as to whether or not the genesis of using the Christmas tree was a, uh, you know, was a Lutheran thing or not, uh, probably tend more to be or not, but, um, you know, he had this idea, you know, the evergreen tree, the, the eternal nature of God and his everlasting love, the candles that were on there. Because, I mean, they didn't have electric lights in those days, obviously. Uh, you know, Christ, the light of the world, uh, uh, those kinds of things that went along with the Christmas idea. Um, one tradition that I remember, and uh, we observe it here, though you may not be aware of it, uh, went with the, uh, there are a couple of traditions with those kinds of things. The Christmas tree, um, the butterfly cross that we have at Easter, that's the last live Christmas tree that we had. You know, it's made out of the limbs from that particular tree. Uh, that was not necessarily something that was done everywhere, but in some congregations they observed that. They, when the Christmas tree came down, that would be made for a cross for Easter time. Um, just like congregations that uh, passed out palms for Palm Sunday, they would be collected, kept you know, behind the altar for a year, and then burned, and those would be the ashes that would be used for Ash Wednesday in those congregations. 
even though the imposition of ashes is not uh, something that the reformers really kept as part of the custom in the congregation. So there are lots of things like that, that uh, but a Christmas tree, in my experience, has been pretty universal in whatever Lutheran congregation, wherever I've lived, you know, that they have done that. Not always three trees. Could be more like Grace Lutheran. Man, there was a tree in every nook and cranny here when I first came here. You, know, you had to have one in the parlor, you had to have one in the family activity center, you had to have one in every classroom, you had to have one in church. Finally, people said, we're getting older, we're tired of putting all those things up. <laughs> you know? Um, I remember as a, as a kid when I think that the emphasis for the decorating the Christmas tree shifted to Christmas. Because I remember it looked like a little cheese slicer that my mom had, uh, but it had a tube on you know, it. You've seen the cheese slices, right, with the wire in there. All right, well, it had like a, a wire that was stretched there, and then they had a little tube in there, and then you put two D batteries inside there, and that heated up that wire so that you could go through the styrofoam and make the, you know, the uh, ornaments. And the ladies did all that kind of stuff. And then each year they would add some, or they would make some new ones and argue over which was a proper Christian symbol and which wasn't. And, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure that wound up on the pastor's desk too. You know, no, the reindeer is not actually a Christian symbol. You, know, you can cut it out of styrofoam and put gold glitter on it, but it doesn't really work that way. Yeah, but pastor, God made all the deer. You know, I can just hear how that goes. Um, and so that has become, I would guess, more common terms of the decoration of Christmas trees in sanctuaries, uh, that they use those chrismon, they call chrismons, which is short for Christ monograms. Right? Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I don't seem to be anywhere else but here on Christmas, so I, I can't really comment on what some other congregations do uh, in, in that respect. But you're saying where you, the church you grew up in no tree. Didn't have a tree. I, do Catholic churches today generally have Christmas trees or don't really know? I don't, I don't know either. I guess you just generally assume that congregations had those. Uh, particular decorations. Um, I don't recall, and it could be just you don't remember everything as a child. I don't recall having an Advent wreath in church as a child. When I got older, I remember Advent, you know, an Advent wreath. And of course, we have one here, but people had Advent wreaths in their home, but I, it wasn't at church on Sunday. Uh, at that point in time. And this is the only congregation in the entire history of cre Christianity that has a Lenten wreath. Actually, not anymore. Not anymore. No. I don't know how that got started or... Maybe Pastor Watson knows all about that stuff. No? A little bit, a little. No. Um, there, it's not that the, it's not apparently that a Lenten wreath has not existed before, because you can find some information uh, when you research that particular custom, but from the pastor's perspective, it's just in the way from the ushers and acolytes perspective, uh, how many candles do we put out this week? Or do we light these? 
I, get, I would get that question all the time. Is this the one where we light them all and put them out, or is this the one where we just don't light them and light one? And I would tell them, I don't know. I'm not in charge of that. It's been a whole year. And, uh, you know, and when I started putting the thorns on there that were really like about that long, and you go by there and, oh, it was almost as bad as communion this past Sunday. Every child that got a blessing, <laughs> static electricity. <laughs> uh, put the hand on their head. I know I'm going to get this. I know I'm going to get this. <laughs> yeah. So. So those customs, uh, you know, those customs happen in different congregations. Um, I never realized that, uh, you know, the Advent uh, candles that there's actually different ways that people made those wreaths, not just besides the four candles, there's one that's kind of like a log that they use and drill different holes. There are like seven candles on, on that particular one, which I've never seen in use, but, but read about it in some uh, liturgical history. Uh, you know, so uh, people have adopted different customs in different places. For Paul going in here, this is a little bit more than a custom. You know, this is a this is this migration from the ceremonial law to understanding that Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law. And so in some ways it's kind of strange that he would do this. And you know, to put the best construction on everything, I think uh, the thought process there would be um, in order to have a chance to share the gospel and to make a report on the great things that God has been doing uh, in the Gentile world, uh, do what's necessary not to ruffle the feathers of certain individuals when you're, you know, when you're there. It's amazing how people's feathers can be ruffled going to church. You know, there's a, there's a whole new hierarchy of, of where people's spot is on Sunday morning when we went from two services to one service. Now some people have remained possessors of their old spot, and some have claimed new spots. It was not something that bothered me. My spot's kind of reserved. You know, uh, those kinds of things where people will say, well, if I'm not going to be able to sit in my spot, I'm not coming to church. Be a good Lutheran. Get here early. Get a back pew. <laughs> when, that, when, the, you know, when the pandemic and the virus is more prevalent in people's minds and we had you know, midweek services for Advent or for Lent. We would tell people, well, sit, sit wherever you want. You know, it's a big place. Where would everybody sit? On the side over there. Why? That's the way it's been happening since Noah got off the ark. All right? And... It, it causes a, a little fear with the ushers sometimes, you know, because uh, they get a little disturbed and there's a little conflict, a little angst back there. Uh, Pastor, we have some visitors come this evening. And they're, they're sitting over on the other side. What should we do? Should we go tell them that we don't sit on that side? <laughs> no, don't. You know, of course, then the visitors come, they look, everybody sits on the other side, and they're, they're going, did I put my deodorant on? Uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a visitor's side, right? A visitor's, visitor's side. All right. So yeah, even in in simple things, sometimes uh, that happens. Uh, people get upset uh, uh, in the in the church, you know, in the church for those kinds of things. 
those are uh, unfortunate when that when that kind of stuff happens. All right, uh, <clears throat> moving on to the next section then, at verse 27, and the next one goes to about uh, verse 36. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, uh, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the, of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. When the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when they came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. That would not be a nice experience if you went to church and were treated that particular way. But they had a great hate for Paul. Uh, who was their hate really for, though? I mean, why did they have a hate for Paul? What did they say? In like what he was preaching. And what was he preaching? God's word. Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. So where is their hate really ultimately directed toward God. Toward God. You know, they will hate you, Jesus says, because they hated me first. Uh, yeah. As Paul is preaching uh, the free gift of salvation. You know, he even brought the, you know, he even brought the Gentiles into the, uh, into the temple. Were Gentiles allowed in the vicinity of the temple? In the court of the Gentiles, they were, but not any farther than that. That would be like saying, <clears throat> you folks can stay out on the front steps. Listen to what you can listen to, but out on the front steps. Inside those front doors, that's not for you. It's not for you. They made an assumption that Paul had brought these people in, and what would they think of those people? Use, use the, the context that Paul has just been through the, you know, after the seven days, you know, this purification, right? He's been through that. What would these people think of Gentiles that would be brought into the inner courts in the temple? They, they were unclean. They were unclean. It would be a, a great offense to them, a great offense to them. And so they just assumed that that's what Paul had, had done, even though he had not done that. He was trying to observe whatever customs that he could do so with a good conscience in order to have opportunity to share the gospel with these people. Uh, and that would have been something that would have been offensive to them but they don't want to listen. Uh, they don't want to listen. Seizing him, beating him, uh, even when he finds a, a small amount of protection from a, a Roman guard, it's, you know, the people want him done away with. Just like they did with Jesus. Well, this is like a bad group there in Jerusalem, huh? Uh, they are, you know, that was their, uh, 
that was their desire. Not really any different in some respects than what Paul had been experiencing in every place that he went. These Jews that followed after him, you know, and tried to get him thrown out of the synagogues and tried to run him out of town, whatever it was. Um, whether this was more severe, it's hard for me to judge. I don't know that it's more severe than, you know, where they hauled Paul out of the city and tried to stone him to death. Um, in, in both cases, uh, it's certainly a severe assault against his person um, by the people that had gathered there. Not a way, not a way that you would think that they ought to behave in church either. the Lord's house and yet they're just consumed by their hate for him and by their hate for God really um, that they're going to in the name of the Lord they're going to do these things and keep it pure and not allow you know this one to come in there who's been you know telling other people that they don't have to keep the law well was Paul telling people they didn't have to keep the law yes and no Paul never told anybody they didn't have to keep the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. He never preached that the, the commandments were abrogated. But he did tell people, you don't have to keep the ceremonial law. Christ has come and he has fulfilled the law. You don't have to have these washings of purification. You don't have to go through circumcision. You don't have to... Uh, uh, limit your diet in terms of foods that are clean and unclean. You don't have to do these things. You know, they're no longer commanded of you. So they are correct in saying those particular things. But they're not correct in any way, shape, or form in thinking that, that Paul in his preaching or in his life was permissive of people uh, disobeying the commandments of God. Well, there, you know, you have a fine coat. Yeah, couldn't really afford it, so I just stole it from some guy that didn't really need it. Oh, well, if you needed it more, then it's okay. No, Paul was never that way. You know, he would never say those kinds of things to people in that respect. So, in terms of the law of Moses, you know, the accusation before that he was telling people they didn't have to do that, um, that's not true. That's not true of Paul's preaching or his ministry. Questions or comments? No? Then let's, uh, let's just finish up this chapter then. Verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no, uh, excuse me, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And we have given him permission, Paul standing on the steps, motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Okay. Uh, he has an opportunity to address them. Uh, they, you know, the soldiers thought he was somebody else. He caused trouble in another place, and now he's causing trouble there. And he says, "No, I'm a, I'm a Jew, from Tarsus in Cilicia. A citizen of no obscure city." He, he wants an opportunity to speak to the people. And, the, uh, and because he has the protection of the Roman soldiers at that point, he's going to get that opportunity. Questions or comments? It's 
So do you think things like this happen in the church yet today? I mean, not necessarily the, uh, the beatings and so on and so forth, but, but uh, uh, that God brings opportunity out of conflict uh, for the truth to be revealed and for the, you know, the people to hear the word of God. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Lottie. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely conflict between denominations maybe not so much now as there was in the early history of our church and what I mean by that is um, I don't think that you know we necessarily uh, as uh, conservative Lutherans have swayed off of the idea that people should join church for doctrine, um, that there is truth and there is falsehood, uh, but, but there are many other mainline denominations that see themselves as being interchangeable with other denominations which they never were before, well, which they never were before. Now the time, and in the time that I was confirmed, back in the in uh, 1971, they waited to confirm us till Pentecost because we were not as bright as the children are today. Uh, we needed that extra instruction. Um, I can't think. Uh, in my remembrance that there were any denominations Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Roman Catholic, that there were any denominations that practiced open communion. Nobody did. Nobody did. Now the the churches, congregations, and denominations that practice closed communion, which is biblical, are few and far between. So that a, a reformed uh, doctrine of the Lord's Supper and, a, and some Lutheran congregations in terms of their uh, practice of the Lord's Supper, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, you know, have now become intertwined on that particular doctrine and accepting of the doctrines of those other denominations. And people say to me, they say, well, really, isn't it, you know, the individual uh, with God? Uh, yes and no. It's both and. It is both the individual relationship with God as well as their relationship with the congregation and the responsibility of the congregation to care for the souls of those people that are coming to the Lord's altar. Well, so in, in some sense, yeah, what you're saying is true, Marty, there are a lot more denominations or, the, or as I like to call it, the, de the denomination of the non-denominationals, you know, um, because they say, well, we're non-denominational. But you ask, well, what do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about this? Pretty soon they identify themselves either more towards the Reformed area or more tor towards Rome or more towards Lutheranism, you know, with some of the practices they have or the doctrines that they have. So we're non-denominational, but yeah. you, you share the same practices and the same doctrines as this particular denomination. Um, it, that's just the way that it is, but people don't see that in our day and age. But in some things, in their practices, and, and because, because what has been so pervasive for the last 60 or 70 years in the United States and in Europe and in denominations is this satanic idea that 
that the Bible is not entirely the word of God. You know, that it's not inspired, that it's not infallible, that it's not the only uh, norm and source for faith and life. So once you get off of that particular platform, um, then, hey, if that's what the Bible means to you, uh, great. And if that's what the Bible means to you, great. You know? And so all of these things that once had this, this staunch denominational identity that said, this is our doctrine, this is our public doctrine because we believe it, it's true from the Bible, uh, or it's been handed down to us in this particular way. Uh, now, it, that doesn't really make any difference. Well, and people will say to me sometimes when they leave Grace Lutheran, that's kind of odd, and they'll go to another denomination. Well, I want you to transfer my membership to XYZ Church. And I'll say, I'll release you to join that congregation, but I won't transfer your membership. Well, what are you talking about? And I said, we don't transfer the care of somebody's soul to a church body that teaches false doctrine. Now, if you, on your own, want to leave the truth and go somewhere, ooh, boy. Talk about setting people's hair on fire. If you did that with me, it wouldn't burn very long. <laughs> to really do that with people that left and went to the ELCA. And I'll send them a letter and say, when you were here, you said you believe this, but now you're going someplace and say that you believe that. Da, 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 da. You know, and I'd say, we, you know, even though you're leaving, we still have a care and concern for your soul. You know, you don't want to embrace this false doctrine. And then that usually led to, Pastor Jacob said I was going to hell. I didn't say you were going to hell. Oh, you're headed in that direction. Well, I didn't say you were going to hell. What I'm trying to point out to you is, once you said this was the truth, and now you say that's false, and this is the truth, what's the truth? Is that what you really believe? Well, is that what you really believe? Is that the truth? Well, usually by that point in time, they made their decision. And, it's, and a lot of times, it has very little to do with doctrine. Number one, sometimes they didn't know that that's what they believed and confessed. As one seminary professor used to tell the students, never ask your people what they believe, because you don't really want to know. And then secondly, sometimes you know, they leave because they're mad at the pastor, they're mad at somebody in the congregation. They get better seating in the other place. Uh, they have better youth group. Um, they have more pizza nights. Whatever it happens to be, they've already made their decisions. That's where they're going to be. You know? There'll be less conflict in the family if we do that, uh, whatever that happens to be. Are there Christians in those places? No doubt. But any place that that false doctrine is allowed to survive here or any place else, it becomes a danger to people's souls. So now that I've uh, springboarded off of Maudie's comment and quit preaching and gone to meddling, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. If you ever get a chance um, and there might be a book in the library, and it's probably, uh, in this day and age, uh, not 100% accurate in terms of, uh, of all of the information, because you can't keep up with that stuff. But uh, either, there are two books, one called Handbook of Denominations, and the other one, the Religious Bodies in America. You know, if you start looking, and they're very well researched, and the comments on each denomination are, are very accurate because they come from the material of that particular denomination. They're not extensive, the comments are not extensively long uh, for a lot of them. They're very brief and to the point and, and a very 
a short summary in some respects, but there are hundreds of denominations and congregations and religious bodies in there. I mean, the books are not yay thick, they're probably about this thick, but you know, if you only write half a dozen lines, you know, or two paragraphs about a denomination and you fill up 150 or 200 pages, that's a lot of church bodies, a lot of congregational uh, and denominational divisions. That's a lot in that respect. Uh, but it would be interesting, you know, for you if you can, you know, if you're interested in saying, well, what do the, you know, what do the Dutch reform teach? Let me go look. I wouldn't look on Wikipedia, but I look in, you know, a book like that where somebody has actually done the research, you know, well, what do the Baptists teach? And he goes, oh my goodness, there's this kind of Baptist and that kind of Baptist and that kind of Baptist. Well, what do the Lutherans teach? Oh my goodness, there's, Missouri Synod, there's Wisconsin Synod, there's ELCA, there's Church of the Refor Lutheran Reformation, there's, you, you know, and you get all of these particular things in there and you say, wow. Um, but in the New Testament, when they started, they were called Christians. Right. We don't, okay, Christian and non-Christian, which, where are you going to be? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Luther would... I think it's pretty well documented that he was not after having a church body named after him. You know. Yeah. What do we confess every Sunday? I believe in the Holy Lutheran Church. No. I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Um, to me, this may just be me, but to me, um, hopefully, in terms of our branch of Lutheranism, uh, there's an equivalency between being Lutheran and being Christian. You know, we should not be teaching something that says, well, this is not really Christian, but it is Lutheran. Then that's the wrong thing. You follow what I'm saying? You know, well, we're going to do this. It's not really Christian, but we're going to do this because it's Lutheran. No. Um, is it is it Christian then is it Christian to have closed communion I'll tell you the answer yes uh, is it Lutheran to have closed communion well yeah because it's Christian you know have our practices been a little bit different than before they were called Lutherans, Catholics, Presbyterians, uh, Methodists, and so on and so forth? Yeah. Why was it closed communion? Because, you know, LSB is a little bit better about differentiating that than TLH was. Uh, you hear us say on Sunday, we're now going to have the service of the sacrament, and that's on page such and such. That's mostly informational. But there was a time in the early Christian church that when you went through the liturgy, you know, confession and absolution, the service of the word, you know, the reading of the lessons and the sermon, um, uh, once you got to the offering, because right, you wanted to have the offering before some people left, uh, I would imagine. Uh, but when you started the service of the sacrament after the prayers, those who were not confirmed were dismissed. And that it was the service of the sacrament was closed to them because they had not been instructed at that point in time in the in the faith. And I know what's going through your mind right now. Well, I wasn't planning on taking communion today, so I guess I'll leave right after the prayers. You know, you're free to do that, I guess. Tell people don't you know don't leave before the benediction. I would tell confirmation kids that don't leave before the benediction. You know God said to to Aaron, and we take it for subsequent generations. When you speak these words over my people, I will be with them and I will bless them. Don't leave before the benediction. You know? But that's what that's the way it was structured. You know? 
do we do we kick the confirmation kids out and the other kids out and visitors out that are not confirmed yet when we go to the service of the sacrament? No, we don't do that. We don't do that. But that's the way that it was before there were denominations. So, all right, well, we're out of time or over time. Any last questions or comments? No? And shall we close with a word of prayer? Gracious Lord, we give thanks to you for the faithfulness of those who have gone on before, even willing to stand up for the truth in the face of danger to themselves. Give us boldness in the time in which we live to speak your word truthfully and to share the good news with others, that your spirit working through your word may convert the hearts of men and that they may share in the joy of salvation that we have found through your grace. Protect and preserve us as we go about our daily tasks, and if it be your will, we pray that you would return us again to this place to worship you and to study your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for coming. I wish I could tell you that the sun is shining now and it was a good day to work outside, but I think it's still... Maybe this 